Western Division One scholarship for men is 25 to 50 percent. Now, let me I'll explain what a scholarship is in a second. But it's 25 to 50 percent. If you get a 50 percent offer, like my son did to get to Northwestern, that's a lot of money, first of all, because Northwestern's a private school. It, you're doing really well. You're doing really well. Don't believe this full ride stuff. Oh, my son or daughter's getting well, daughters maybe, but son, I'm getting a full ride. Because we'll talk about what a full ride is in a second. Don't always believe that. They're very, very, very full, full rides for men in, in school. For women, their scholarship is closer to full. It's 75 to 100 percent. It's just a different way they do it. Okay. Division two and AIA and JUCO, junior colleges, typically award smaller percentages. They have less money to work with. They're smaller schools with smaller programs, but they generally have less. But in Division one, that's what you're looking at. Okay. Full scholarship. What is included? Who can tell me what's included in the full scholarship? Give me one one item that's included in the full scholarship. Tuition. Tuition. What else? Right. Books. Books. Correct. What else? Huh? Somebody said room and board, I think, right? Yeah, room and board. What else? Meals. That's board. That's part of room and board. What else? Huh? Yeah, trip cost return. That's right. That's part of the expense of running the program. Correct. You don't pay any out of pocket for cost to go to jail. That's correct. Fees. Room, board, tuition, books, and all fees. So if you have a laboratory fee, you know, for like chemistry lab, stuff like that. All that's paid for. <coughs> that is a full rider, what's called an FRE, a full ride equivalent. So when somebody says they got a full ride, my question is, oh, you got room, board, tuition, books, and all fees. Uh, no, we got tuition. Not a full ride. Okay. There you go. Tuition, fees, books, room, and board for one academic year. You get awarded a scholarship one year at a time. You're not given a scholarship for all four years. It's one year at a time. It's renewable or cancelable every single year. Sacrifices and in college, if you're going to do this, and that's not just true for golfers. It's true for all that. The process for improvement has to be there for you to be committed for a level of success. You got to, you're going to be into nutrition, mental training, golf instruction, swing and short game, competition, and equipment evaluation are all part of a viable college golf program. Some of the college programs have relationships with equipment manufacturers, and you can get a lot of equipment. Sometimes they have an allowance. The team has so many dollars worth of allowance that they can buy so much stuff. But, you know, this is all part. If you're going to be committed, you have to have a real commitment level in your junior golf years because you need to take that into your college golf years to be committed to succeed at the college level. Seniors, real quick, some notes about seniors. No. Remember, there are 1,200 men's programs and 700 women's programs. You know, you can read articles on the junior golf scoreboard about going to college and the big college golf college, and you're not recruited. It's the name of those. There's lots, still a lot of opportunities for you. You got to keep your grades up. You got to keep playing events. Do your best fit analysis. Keep plugging away at best fit analysis. Contact schools. You can use the golf big college rankings, but sort of. Bounce the golf league rankings against the signings list and say, ooh, this, and, and say, ooh, this coach can get everybody they wanted. You can use, as I said, the signings list. It's all right. And you can call us. Absolutely call us anytime. And we can help you out a little bit there. Not that we're going to recommend you to a school, but we can help you out and, and sort of help you work through the key process. Okay. Real quick summary here. Do your best in school. Show that you can do the work. Show the school that, let me, let me explain something about how this works. A college, a, a college coach wants to recruit you. So what he asks you to do is he asks you to send a transcript to him or to your admissions department. And so you have to seal up this, to get your guidance office, seal up this transcript and mail it off to the school. Then the coach gets the admissions department to open that up and the admissions department says, okay, this kid is a fit here. Once the admissions department does that, then the coach can offer you a, uh, make you an offer. And once they make you an offer and you accept, your application that you still have to fill out to get into college is stamped as a student athlete and you are in fact admitted. So you're out of the pool of the general admissions, you know, except maybe Division 3. 
But you're, at, you're, you're, you're going to sell through them. You still have to fill out the application. You still have to write the essay. You still have to do all that. But you're, you're selling through the process. Get better and improve. It's always about getting better. That's true of anything you need to Not just going. Find your best fit. Do the research. Don't just blindly send out 100 letters. Pick the schools that you know are right for you. Small, medium, large, rural city, how far from home. Chance to play. Or are you going to have a chance to play? I know kids who turned down big schools because they weren't going to travel and play with the team. And they played at <coughs> schools that were very good. By the way, when you're writing a letter to a coach and you see that their number five player is averaging 76 per round and you think you can play better than that, and you write a coach and say, hey coach, I think I can replace your number five player. <laughs> They don't care. <laughs> they want you to write them telling you to replace the number two player. Now, now we're talking. So when you're looking to see who you're better than on that team or you think you're better, don't be looking at the number five player. You know, let them know you're interested. You've got to be proactive. You've got to be proactive. If you handle yourself professionally, you send them a nice looking resume and an email, and you've researched the program, you call the coach by name, you point out the fact that the team has done well, you talk about an academic program that's unique to your school that you're interested in being involved in. And you, and you say, here are the highlights of where are my competitive people to your operators at this point. And you put that in the cover letter, it shows the coach you've done your research. You've done your research, you've rifle shot focused on your program. So, but you've got to be proactive to do that. Don't sit at home thinking some coach is going to come knocking on your door just because he knows where you live. You've got to let him know. Read some of my coach and be proud of them. To have a representative school. The way you conduct yourself in the golf course, the way you write your letters, the way you're clean and not typo free, you know, or your emails, you know, you know just be somebody that they're proud of that they can have. You know, I often tell coaches, you know, this is a real coat and tie kid. The reason I say that is because coach, you're going to be proud to have that kid in the coat and tie representing your, representing your school. It's a very systematic approach. One of the things I helped Princeton Paolini do before he went to do was we actually sat down and made up a grid. We put down all the schools on the left-hand side. We put all the factors that were, all, that were relevant to each school, coach, facilities, and academics, all the way across the country. And he graded each one. He gave each one, some of them were weighted more than others. And he actually did this kind of little mathematical description. And he was very objective about it. His father helped him do a lot of it. But it was a great way to determine where his best fit was. So there you have it. The college process, the junior golf process, how it works. Um, hopefully, I have it on over. No, you're, that's it. You're perfect. Any questions? I got a question. Exactly, yeah. I mean, we have all this information. Where's the first place that we should kind of start with it? I mean, what would you suggest step 1B in this whole process? Depends where you are in school. Where are you in school? Give me a hypothetical year in high school. Freshman, sophomore. Freshman, I think you should maybe just generally start on the junior high school board and read about the college recruiting articles, okay, and how college recruiting happens. Um, and I think that also uh, you should be focused on your competitive junior golf plan and see where you are there. So there's no, there's no center place of reading about this. But that's where I would start with that. If you're a sophomore, then you ought to be definitely reading the articles on, you know, going to college, the big college golf guide. That's where you ought to start to understand the college recruiting process. Yes, sir. Comparing the collegiate competitive golf to junior golf, as far as family is concerned, and the collegiate golf, do they do more uh, 36 hole events, or they do them more? around in the morning, around in the afternoon, or are they in the same format? Of it? No, they do 54, typically they do 54 hole events, they go practice one day, and they do 54 hole events, they do 36 holes on one day and 18 early in the morning on the second day, so they can make plane flights and get out of there on the second day. So they're carrying their own bags for 36 holes uh, on, on the first day. So there's a lot more stamina involved in that. Uh, I mean, if you want to compare it to something, Try uh, a U.S. junior qualifier here in the Philadelphia area where they do 36 holes.